Welcome back. Welcome back. We are doing our fall study of debunking myths about Christianity. And last week we talked about, uh, we debunked the myth that Christianity is anti-science. We looked at a few things, uh, particularly how the Bible is full of scientific statements. This week we're going to be moving on to the next myth that the Bible is full of contradictions. Um, but the first thing we need to do before we can even address this is to just define what is a contradiction. So can anyone just give us a quick definition what a contradiction is? Jingus. A contradiction would be something like um, the same book that says this happens is the same book that says this does not happen. Okay, yeah. two statements that cannot coexist. Two statements that cannot coexist. That's a really good definition. I spent like 20 minutes trying to find one. That's much better than what the internet had to say. Yeah, it would be like someone saying, it's raining outside, and someone else saying, it is not raining outside. Now, in Western PA, maybe that's true. Maybe it is like raining here, but it's not raining there. But in most cases, right, that would not be true. It cannot be raining and also not be raining at the same time. And of course, you all know this. You know what a contradiction is. Um, but two things that cannot be true at the same exact time. So to say that the Bible is full of contradictions, well, that's a really big deal uh, because that is an attack on the consistency as well as the credibility of the Bible. The consistency and the credibility are under attack. Now, we don't have time today to cover every single objection, uh, every reason why some people might believe the Bible is full of contradictions. So we're really just going to look at three uh, umbrella reasons why. If someone doesn't believe the Bible is really true, they believe that you know it's a mixed mash of things uh, that don't always line up with each other, they're probably going to fall into one of these three groupings that we're going to talk about today. So number one, making sure the slides go along with me, a reason why a person might believe the Bible is full of contradictions is because they might just think that there are too many translations of the Bible. And there are a lot of translations. Does anyone want to guess how many translations in English alone of the Bible there are? Jingus. Like 427. I don't actually know, but that's probably in the ballpark. I was wondering if any of you knew. Um, I wasn't going to count. But there are a lot. There are at least a few hundred translations of the Bible. So for someone who goes to church on a regular basis, myself, who's read through the Bible, I know that a lot of the translations, they all pretty much uh, have the same general idea. We're going to talk about that more in a couple minutes. Um, but when I worked as a car salesman, I worked with a guy uh, who told me that he, he didn't think uh, that the Bible lined up. He asked me, he said, you know, how come there are so many different translations of the Bible? And if there are so many different translations, then um, how do you know which Bible is true? And I thought, that's a very valid question. If you don't go to church and you're not very familiar, but you know there's a King James, you know there's an NIV, whatever that stands for, you know uh, there's an ESV, you know there's an NIRV, uh, you know there's an ASB, you know there's all these different abbreviations. So I thought that was a really good question. He said, why are there so many translations and how do you know which translation is true? And we're going to put pause on that real quick. Mark, can you hand out those papers that I gave you? So if you have ever wondered why there are so many translations of the Bible, uh, you are definitely not alone. I've wondered that as a student. I've wondered that as a young adult until I was able to learn more about it. While Mark hands out these papers, there are a couple of reasons for this. There's a couple of reasons why there's a lot of translations of the Bible in English. Number one, the most important is that the Bible was not originally written in English. It was written in other languages. Does anyone know what languages the Bible was originally written in? Hebrew. Good job, Blaine. Hebrew for most of the Old Testament. Absolutely. What was the other language used in the Old Testament? Does anyone know? Genghis, again. Arabic. Close. Aramaic. Ah. I know. Arabic, Aramaic. Very close. Um, does anyone know what language the New Testament was written in? Blaine. Roman. Not. The Romans would have spoken this language. Matthias. Greek. Greek, yes, good job. So the Romans would have spoken Greek for sure, Blaine. Um, so the Bible was written in Hebrew, it was written in Aramaic, and it was written in Greek. It was not written in English. I know, that's so mind-blowing. Uh, but that's very important because the Bible then has to be translated not just from one language, but from three different languages, and it has to be translated into English. Now I want you to think about your biggest textbook in school. 
picture, you know, your day-to-day -day classes. What is your biggest textbook? Uh, Everett, what's your biggest textbook? History. History? Okay. Jenny? I like history. history as well. Okay, interesting. Silas? My dictionary. Your dictionary. You have to carry a dictionary around with you? It's like this thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's painful. Uh, okay, so think about your biggest textbook and all of the information in there. Now, I want you to think about trying to translate that into another language, something hard like German. Think about the challenge that would be. You not only have to translate the words, right, word for word, but you also have to try to convey the meaning behind these words into this other language that it was not written into. That is not going to be an easy process. Uh, translation is not an easy process. So as you can see on the papers that Mark handed out, uh, the Bible translations are pretty much broken up into one of three groupings. They are either a word-for-word -word translation of the Bible, they are a thought-for-thought -thought translation of the Bible, and there are some, it's not very common, they're not usually used, uh, but there can also be a paraphrase uh, translation, if you will, of the Bible. Now we're going to look at one verse in uh, all three of these groupings. We're going to look at a verse, Romans 12, 2. In ESV, a word-for-word -word translation, it says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so in this word-for-word -word translation, the ESV is keeping in English uh, the literal phrases from Greek, like uh, conformed to the pattern of this world. And that's, that's a very formal way to put it, right? Like no one's going to say, you're conforming to the pattern of this world. Um, that's just kind of weird. So it's a little more formal or complex. Next, the NLT. This is a thought-for-thought -thought translation of the Bible. And it says, for the same verse, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn how to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So a translation like this, uh, a thought-for-thought -thought translation, is less focused on making sure that the same words are retained in English, but making sure that the thought is communicated in English, uh, making verses you know, a, little more, a little more clear, a little more easier to understand for the regular reader like you and I. They're not going to throw in things like conform to the pattern of this world. Did you have a question? I just noticed that like, it had the don't instead of do not. There you go. Did not notice that. Good job. All right, if you're still with me, say, huh? Huh? If you're still paying attention, say, huh? Okay, I don't want to lose you guys in this. Uh, so word for word, a little more formal, uh, a little more true to the original language, thought for thought. It's a little bit easier to understand for the, the regular reader like you and I. God bless you. You said that's all right, so that's two groups. Uh, one more group of Bibles in English, the paraphrase. Uh, and we see here, this is the message, a paraphrase version of the Bible. It says, don't become so well adjusted to the culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Oh, it doesn't have all that. Yeah, I, I just split it up into two slides. It's the same verse that we just read, but it's like twice as long. Um, so those Bibles, it'd be like the size of the dictionary that you have to carry around with you. The paraphrase, they're throwing in all these words. So that's very different, right? It's very simple. It might be a very easy concept to understand, but the spiritual depth... In a paraphrased version of the Bible, it, spiritual depth is quickly getting lost, right? It's quickly getting lost because it, it's, it's like too casual. You know, it's not too formal, but it's getting too casual. Um, so I would say if you're reading a paraphrased version of the Bible, that's okay. It's good to read the Bible to know what it says, but I would not stay in a paraphrased version of the Bible for very long. I would look at deciding for yourself. Do you think that uh, word for word? version of the Bible fits better for yourself and your personality, or does a thought for thought work a little bit better for you, a little bit easier to understand? So back to my friend at the car dealership, and I just, I told him when he asked me, I said, well, there are a lot of translations for the Bible. That's true. And I told him, you know, some focus on 
the word for word, some focus on thought for thought. I use the translation analogy of trying to translate a book and how that would be difficult going from one language to another. Never mind three languages into one language. Uh, the sentence structure might be different in some Bibles, some translations, um, but the overall core meaning of the verses doesn't really get lost in one translation to another. So it's good. It's actually a good thing to read the same chapters in the Bible using different translations. It can help you get a fuller picture of what God's Word really says, what the meaning behind a passage really is. So with my friend, nothing crazy happened. Like, I didn't lead him to the Lord. And, you know, his whole life was completely different. We just had a conversation, and it gave him something to think about. All right, reason number two why someone might believe the Bible's full of contradictions is that they might think the Bible has changed a lot over time. The Bible was written a long time ago. Uh, citation is not needed there. We all know that. The Bible was written by over 40 different people in three different languages. And it talks about things that happen on three different continents, right? We see things that happen in Israel a lot in the Bible. Geographically, Israel would fall into Asia. We see in Paul and some of his missionary journeys and the churches he writes to, some of that takes place in Europe. And there are a lot of things in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament that occur in Egypt, which is in Africa. So the Bible is talking about events on three different continents in three different languages. And again, authored by around 40, probably a little bit more than 40 different people. So you think about the variables, three languages and all of these people writing on things happening around the world. You would think that the Bible would have a lot of issues lining up. Like we see that in book series. Joanne is wearing, I assume that is a Harry Potter, Gryffindor shirt. Oh, uh, uh, Slytherin. We're going to Jake edit that out. Slytherin shirt. It's the green. Um, Harry Potter. You think about it, There's all kinds of plot holes. There's seven books. Seven books from one author. And there's so many things that could have been different. Cedric Diggory died. Why didn't they use a time turner to go back and save him? They easily could have. Big plot hole. Uh, we see that in movies. Right? My wife's mad. She's a Harry Potter fan. We see that in movies. If anyone who's seen Avengers Endgame, raise your hand. Avengers Endgame. Most of us have. Um, pretty good movie, but you wonder, why didn't Doctor Strange use the Time Stone to bring life back to Tony Stark? He did it in the movie Doctor Strange with an apple. Easily could have saved him. Instead, he watched and looked on as Tony Stark faded away. Plot holes. They're everywhere with just one person creating. But you think about the Bible with the language barriers and with the time barriers being written thousands of years apart, some of it, with all the people involved, we see that it is very, very, very consistent from cover to cover. Lots and lots of consistency found in the Bible. There are over 5,800 Greek copies of the New Testament like Greek, the original language it was written in. That is a lot. The New Testament, the copies of the New Testament in Greek, they are like three times the amount of copies we have of any other ancient text. The New Testament is a very, very well-documented source of ancient literature. The Old Testament also has around a couple thousand manuscripts copied as well that are cataloged. And within the last hundred years, even, we've found more copies of what the Old Testament says in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s, only 80 years ago. Uh, copies of books like Isaiah, Genesis, almost every single book in the Old Testament we have in the Hebrew or the Aramaic, and it lines up with what we already understand the Old Testament to say. So lots of consistency found there. And the reason for this is because while, yes, the Bible has a human author, we know that the Bible also has a divine author author, uh, God, which is why it does not contain uh, any of these plot holes as we would think about it. The Bible tells us that God is the author in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The focal point there is that it's God-breathed. It is inspired by God to the human writers who then write it down. That doesn't mean every copy of, oh, let me back up. It doesn't mean every single old copy of the Old New Testament are perfect. That's not true. There are plenty of old copies of the Old and New Testament where there are errors. There's like, you know, you didn't have autocorrect or spell check uh, when they were 
copying the Bible by hand, so people are going to mess up words. They might not be legible. People make mistakes. But luckily, since we have thousands and thousands of copies of the Bible, we can compare a difference and go with the majority rules. All right, number three, and this is really getting to the heart of the issue, you know, why people might believe that the Bible is full of contradictions is, well, they might say that the Bible has contradicting records of the same event, that here in the Bible it says one thing, and here in the Bible it says something else, and how do we, how do we fit that together? Uh, in many cases, I think what happens here is that this is just a matter of perspective, you know, the Bible might give us one person's perspective here, and later on, or in a different book, it gives us a second, or a third, or a fourth perspective. It'd be like, uh, be like watching a movie, right? You and your friend, and your one friend has a take on what happens, and you have a take on what happens, and you ex you're explaining the movie to someone else, and you might share different things. doesn't mean that one of you is wrong. It just means you have different perspectives on the same event. So an example, uh, Judas Iscariot. We're going to talk about him. Judas, one of the 12 disciples, he betrays Jesus uh, into getting arrested. And then after that, who knows what happens to Judas? Jingus. Yeah, he, he dies. And there are two accounts of the death of Judas, and that's what we're going to look at. We see one account in Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 27, it says, When Judas, who betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, Judas said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? The Pharisees replied, that's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left, and he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it's against the law for us to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they used the money to buy a potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then they... Then what was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, was fulfilled. That they took 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. So, according to the Gospel of Matthew, what we see with Judas, his story, his end, is that his end comes by hanging himself. But Acts gives us a little bit of a different perspective on the situation. In Acts 1, 18-19, it says... And Luke is inserting this. They're talking about why Judas has to be replaced. So Luke's explaining what happened to him, hence the parentheses. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open. All of his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called that field, in their language, Alcadema. That is, the field of blood. So here... Uh, we see that Judas has burst open like someone sitting on a bag of unopened Doritos. Just pop. It's all bursting out. So this might seem a little bit contradictory. Um, you know, we see strangulation. We see high-impact trauma being the cause of death for Judas. But let's take into account their perspectives. Matthew. Uh, who can tell me some fun facts about Matthew real quick? So anything you know about Matthew the disciple? Uh oh, Matthew, we know he was a tax collector. We know that Matthew was a Jew. We know that Matthew was one of the disciples. And it was very important uh, for us to understand that Matthew was Jewish. And that when Matthew wrote down his gospel, Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. So Matthew makes a point, uh, and he says, uh, let's see, not this one, but the next one. Notice the second half that what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled, and then he shares this prophecy that Jeremiah wrote. For the Jewish people, that was a really big deal. This is a prophecy about their Messiah, and uh, Matthew's explaining, hey, here's what happens, and this is a fulfillment of a prophecy about our coming Messiah, so you should really believe that Jesus is our Messiah uh, because he's fulfilling this prophecy from so, so long ago. And Matthew highlights that in his gospel. Luke, on the other hand, Luke is not Jewish. Uh, Luke is a Gentile, which is just anyone who's not Jewish, and Luke also worked as a doctor. So when we look back into Luke's account, uh, Luke talks about the cause of death, right? He's a doctor, he's diagnosing this, and he says his body burst open and all of his intestines spilled out. 
just different perspectives. So is it strangulation or is it high impact force or trauma that causes the death of Judas? Well, we're not specifically told an explanation. And we talked about this last week. The Bible tells us uh, the why. The Bible focuses on the why, but it does not always focus on the how. It doesn't tell us how we get there. Um, that doesn't mean no explanation exists. There's plenty of explanations, three, four, five, that could explain how this happened. One of the simplest uh, would just be that Judas hung himself in a tree, and that the tree was the branch he was hanging from was hanging over the field that the Pharisees bought using, Ju using Judas's money, maybe even in Judas's name. And whether a branch broke or you know whatever he used uh, broke, or his body just slipped out and it crashes and it falls down. And you can get even farther with it. You can talk about bacteria in a dead body and how that creates gas and the gas floats the body and it makes your skin more susceptible to burst open. A uh, problem with dead bodies, very scientific, right? We know the Bible full of scientifically accurate statements. Um, but it's just different perspectives. And it's not to say that they contradict each other. They can go hand in hand together. So I would say that many times that not every time, but many times when the Bible seems to contradict itself, it's probably just a matter of different perspectives. And when you look at who wrote it, when you look at who the book was written to at the time of writing, it's going to make a lot more sense. You guys still with me? Yeah. Say, huh? Oh. <laughs> we're going to keep doing that. Does this make sense to you guys? Yeah. Is this making sense? I have another? Okay, we're good. Jesus would often speak in parables so that people could understand what he was teaching about. He would use objects that people could relate to. He'd talk about faith being like a mustard seed. Seed, you put it in the ground and it grows out. He would call himself the good shepherd and we're like sheep. And we know the good shepherd's voice as sheep knew the voice of the shepherds uh, who watched over them back in the day. So I think sometimes a great way to, to talk about what we believe in is to just be very casual with it, right? We don't have to be very formal. We don't have to like go up and say, my brother or sister in Christ, you are a sinner and you must repent of your sins and you must believe what I believe or you're going to, and you don't have to do that, right? That's kind of weird. If someone did that to me, I probably would not want to listen to anything they have to say. But we can be very casual. We can just uh, use regular everyday objects to share about what we believe in. Like with my friend at the car dealership, we just had a regular conversation and I just brought up, you know, you like to read. What's this book you read? Okay, imagine translating that into another language. So we do have an object lesson for you. Uh, I need one volunteer. First person to raise their hand. Blaine. All right, Blaine, come on up here. Uh, Daniel, can you bring up the table that's in the back? We're going to set it up. Say hi to everyone, Blaine. Hi. <laughs> Here we have the banana, a favorite fruit of mine. Wayne, you can take the banana. We're going to bring that up to the stage. Watch out, Wayne. Someone said Mario Kart. That's bringing back some, some PTSD. Bring back some PTSD for me. All right, we've got to make sure we don't make a big mess here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Put your banana no. down. No. All right, we're not going to crush the banana. What did I write down for this? Hold up the banana. The banana is a very simple object. You peel it. <laughs> Give it a, a nice good peel there. And you eat it. Go ahead. <laughs> and that's it. It's a very simple object. You can only do, well, you can do three things with it. You can peel it, eat it, and you can slip on it. Very casual transition. Some verses in the Bible are very simple to understand. Like this banana. For example, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's a pretty straightforward verse. There is very little like guesswork in there for what John 3, 16 means. It's very straightforward. It's very simple, just like Blaine's banana. 
What is not simple is a Google Pixel 4a. Oh, we're going to put that on the brick there. We don't want any accidents. It is a complex, complicated object. Actually, hold it up. <laughs> it's a camera, a flashlight, a calculator. You can call, text, scroll, and troll using the Google Pixel 4a. Some areas in the Bible and our faith are complex, and they can be a little bit harder to understand, such as the two accounts of the death of Judas. <laughs> if you read about the death of Judas in Matthew and Acts, you might ask yourself why the Bible contradicts. That would be like trying to turn on your phone. But instead of hitting the power button, you take off the phone case, <laughs> you take off the phone case, that's your cue, you set it down on a brick, you pull out a hammer, <laughs> and you try to turn your phone on by hitting it as hard as you can with a hammer. You don't want to do it? You want to go for it? Hard as you can. Don't be shy. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, everyone's going to do it now. See, now we should volunteer next week. And you do this 10 times. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, bring it back. Turn it over. And we're going to do it one more, one more time. That was only nine. All right. Now, show them what you've accomplished. Blaine has, in fact... Not turned on the phone. <laughs> Just like it can be easy to misunderstand the complex areas of scripture, it can be easy to try turning on your phone by smashing it with a hammer. See how casual and smooth this transition is? All right, give Blaine a round of applause. Blaine, great job. Keep the phone there. Take your banana. Keep, leave the phone. He's not going to take the phone. <laughs> no, I'll, uh, Verizon says I'll get a new iPhone if I turn this in. <laughs> so the Bible, in all seriousness, you know, some of it is very simple and it's very easy to understand. But other parts of the Bible, they are a little more complex. They, they take a little bit more understanding. And if people are asking questions, that is where you can come into play. Uh, you can be a blessing to other people. You know, I don't know everything about the Bible. No one knows everything about the Bible, but I know a lot. I'm sure a lot of you also know a good bit. And so what you can do, what you have the power to do, is you can still be a blessing to the people around you. You can have regular conversations. You can have, um, you can answer questions that your friends have, or maybe they say something and you can say, well, you know, why do you think that? And here's what I think about that. You know, do you want to, can we talk about this for just a moment? Most people are open to conversations. Right, just casual, regular conversations. A lot of people are open to just conversing about what they believe in. If you can take away one thing, it is don't leave your friend smashing their phone with a hammer in a spiritual sense. So, challenge for you. Oh, who completed the challenge from last week, by the way? Um, the challenge was, if you weren't here last week, I just wanted you to name one scientist who had a strong faith that invented or discovered something still relevant for us today. Silas, you had one. Can you share it with us? Aubrey Davy discovered seven new elements. This guy, I can't say his name, discovered seven new elements. Can you rattle them off again? You did earlier. Boron, barium, calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium, and strontium. Well done. Good job, Silas. <laughs> All right, Jafon. Louis Pasteur. I, I think so. And what did he do? He just proved the spontaneous generation. Yes, if you remember from last week, the man who thought he discovered rats come from grain, like from grain turns into rats, uh, Mr. Pasteur, he discovered that was in fact not true. Uh, anyone else complete last week's challenge? All right, Silas, Jaden, Ian, do you have one? Uh, Galileo? Mm. 
Okay, he had a strong faith, is that right? Uh-huh. And what did he do? He found out that Earth wasn't the center of the universe. It's not? Oh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the three of you go see Daniel. Daniel has prizes back there. Good job. Challenge, good job. Uh, challenge for next week, read a chapter of the Bible in three different translations. Three different translations, and I want the chapter to be at least 15 verses long. So read a chapter of the Bible, read it in three different translations, and make sure that the chapter is at least uh, 15 verses long. No, th- just a chapter, just one chapter. I know, very, very simple. Yes. Do you have to understand it, or can you just read it without understanding? Just read it. Wait. You don't have to like explain to me in depth what so it means. Just, just read it. Simple. Yeah. Yes. Do you mean like in another language or another version of the Bible? Yeah. So let me back up. So when I say translation, <laughs> I don't mean like learn a language and read the Bible in that language. Uh, if you have the Bible app on your phone, the Bible app has like I don't know over 50 different translations, versions of the Bible. You could just read it uh, very simply. You can go to King James. You can go to uh, NIV. You can go to NASB. It's very simple. So one chapter, at least 15 verses long, three different translations or versions. Next week, tell me what chapter you read. Tell me what uh, translations you read it in, and youth ministry will give you a prize. But yes. Still stand. Can you read it in another language and not understand a word? <laughs> no, I want you to read it in three different English translations. And I want at least one to be a thought for thought and at least one to be the word for word. Again, I would kind of avoid the paraphrasing Bibles because they don't even look at like a language really. They just look at what English is already translated and then they paraphrase the English into something else. Mm-hmm. So not, not very good for learning God's word really. That's the challenge for next week. Uh, Again, don't leave your friend spiritually smashing their phone with a hammer. We're better than that. We can be a blessing to others. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll do Kahoot to review. Father God, uh, we just thank you so much, again, for the people who made sacrifices so that we could read the Bible in English. Uh, We thank you for the Bible, for your word. And we ask that as we go about our week, as we run into people who have spiritual questions, we live in a very spiritually hungry world world. We know your word says that the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. May we just be open to having these conversations with the people around us, the people in our circle of influence. May we be able to be a blessing to these people when they have questions. Give us courage. Give us boldness. May we not feel too shy to speak up because all we have to do is open our mouth and your word, your spirit will do the rest of the work, Lord. We just have to be willing. We thank you for who you are and uh, may we have a good night. In your name, amen.